so here the artists turn your attention to Botticelli, a very famous artist, and we get two more paintings that help us think about humanism and the classical Greek tradition that comes alive again in the Renaissance mind. Let's look first coming down here at the very famous birth of Venus. So the painting depicts Venus, the Greco-Roman goddess of beauty and erotic love, who was said to have been born from the foam of the sea. And Botticelli cleverly invents a seashell for her to ride like a surfboard. As an ideal of female beauty, Botticelli's Venus has had a huge afterlife. So I've Googled Venice, California mural of roller skating Venus to show you that there are, there are in Venice, California, there's more than one mural appropriating Botticelli in a humorous way, putting it on a roller skating vision. So she has the same long flowing hair, the same bodily position and gesture, which I'll talk about in a moment, in various different versions. In this one version, we get the figure coming in, flying in to cover her up, which is from the original Botticelli. She doesn't really need it because she's wearing shorts, leg warmers, and a top here, but quoting the Botticelli there, which is very fun. And if you come down here, if you play around on the internet and find some of these, I found a New Yorker cover that also was, I thought, worth looking at. Here she is on her seashell and everybody's taking a photo of her. Besides the humor, there's a lesson that we get when we look at the modern day copies because they show us how important Venus's stance and her, ge her gestures are to the memorability and meaning of the image. So I want to address those two points and I want to start with the stance. Look at how her weight is shifting on her legs. Notice that her weight is leaning onto one straightened leg and the other leg is bending. And because of that, her pelvis is slightly shifted, slightly hiked up onto the side of the, where the weight bearing is happening. This stance is important. It is called contrapposto and that term means sort of oppositional weight bearing, but it refers to a stance that was critically important in Greek and Roman sculpture. So it is a sign of the Greco-Roman past, and it is a humanistic element in the artwork. So here's the word contrapposto counterpositioning in a sense, defined as weight balanced between a weight bearing leg and a relaxed leg. So here you're seeing it in Donatello's bronze sculpture of David from around, let's say 1450, so mid 1400s. And I'm contrasting it on the left with an earlier sculpture, 1408 to 1409, when Donatello made out of marble the same subject, David from the Bible but he doesn't quite have contrapposto fully formed here. This is a little more Gothic. This is a little more of a kind of sideways sway. We call it the Gothic sway rather than a real clear tension between the weight bearing and the relaxed leg jutting forward. It's not quite clear where the weight is here. The relaxed leg doesn't jut forward fully in a bent position. So Donatello is learning to do contrapposto and finding it more important as we move along in the time of the Renaissance because of this increasing humanistic study of ancient Greek and Roman art. Let me show, here's a sculpture, a very famous sculpture by the ancient Greek artist Praxiteles from 450 BCE that shows you very clearly that contrapposto is about really studying how the body carries weight on one leg, what that means for the pelvis, kind of shifting to the side and then you have the relaxed leg and then you actually have a relaxed arm and an engaged arm that are oppositional 
engaged side, engaged, relaxed, relaxed. And these are the kind of artworks that sculptors like Donatello are studying in detail and wanting to know how to achieve the same effects. Coming back to Venus, let's look at her gesture. In a way, she's repeating what contrapposto does, although actually the Greeks would have switched which arm was engaged and which was relaxed. But really no arm is re relaxed for her because something else is going on. She's covering herself. And this is really important because when we look at this painting, we have to think not only about humanism, but about gender and sexuality. It's strange if you think about it, that a goddess in charge of sexuality and beauty would cover herself at birth and have an attendant swoop in with a fabric to cover her up entirely as quickly as possible. The textbook says that Venus covers her breasts and genitals in a way that draws attention to them. That's true enough, but the authors fail to tell you that much of the most significant recent scholarship has connected this gesture of covering to the negative attitude toward the female body, especially female sexuality, that was prevalent in Renaissance Italy, which was a thoroughly patriarchal and very misogynistic culture. Medical and anatomical books published at the time declared the female body to be diseased and flawed. And we will see a pattern of art where the female body is treated as shameful, even when eroticized. We saw it in Masaccio when the angel expels Adam and Eve from the gates of paradise. We see that Adam covers his face in anguish, as if his sense of shame is located in his thoughts and actions. But Eve covers her breasts and genitals, as if her shame were located in her sexuality, in her body itself.